Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's good to see you all here. Um, I'm Carmen. Um, I'm a former graduate of, of Mises University. I'm not sure which generation I am or whether I should say which generation I am because it's... Um, but if any of you are interested in becoming the fifth generation, was it, of Mises U scholars, let me just tell you right now, it doesn't get any easier stepping over here on this podium, especially when Dr. Salerno is in the room. So I shall not be looking into that direction at all and probably not speaking and trying to avoid Dr. Salerno for the rest of the day uh, after my talk. So just so you know why I'm standing so awkwardly for the next 45 minutes, all right? Um, so my first task of this afternoon is to keep you awake after that wonderful lunch. My second task is to tell you about division of labor and society. Now, um, this lecture has been given in the past by people um, a lot more competent than I am at giving this lecture, but so I will emphasize somewhat different things as we go through today. Um, in the hope that together with those past lectures, you get a complete picture of what division of labor uh, really is. Division of labor is my Roman Empire. I think about it all the time. Um, and I'll try to explain by the end of the lecture today as to why, because I think it's very easy to fall prey to the illusion that division of labor is a small concept, that it can be discussed either in international trade theory, and that's great, fantastic, um, or it's a small chapter in Mises' human action and so on. But really, I want you to, if you take one thing away from today's lecture, don't leave yet, but if you take one thing away from today's lecture is that division of labor really is the market economy. So what we're going to do um, today is I'm going to tell you a little bit how uh, theory developed um, since the 13th centuries and so on, sort of what are the key highlights and the key differences between treatments in the division of labor. I will give you some fundamental concepts and terms that we're going to be talking about uh, because I'm a former uh, PhD student of Dr. Holzman and he has drilled into me that you have to start with definitions. Where I'm going to give you a little example of Ricardian comparative advantage, how it looks like mathematically between um, um, two individuals exchanging. But I will emphasize here much more than that, um, the fact that you have to think about it in monetary terms and how much richer and broader and more all-encompassing the Misesian law of association really is. And time permitting, We'll talk about implications for trade, society, and social order. If I don't get to cover them all, please chase me after the lecture and I'll happily tell you everything that I've missed. So the division of labor as a concept really started to be, you can, you can see treatments, you can find treatments of it, even in Plato and Aristotle and some of the early Chinese philosophers. But it was with the Latin scholastic movement in the 13th and 14th century that it started to be discussed as a concept as such. Provided, however, that the discussions at that point um, were more related to philosophical sort of general questions um, and not so much economic in tone. So it was with the Scottish Enlightenment and the classical economics in the 18th century, particularly starting with Adam Smith and then David Hume and following on with Ricardo and Mill, that the issue of division of labor really started to be treated as an economic question. So the economic question there became, why does the separation of employment among persons have important economic consequences? Yeah, uh, And it's at this time that we can start talking about something that we can call the political economy of the uh, division of labor. Um, so you have Adam Smith and the invisible hand, um, the metaphor, which I'm sure you very well know, that organizes production and uh, exchange at social level. And the idea there, according to Smith and the classical economists, is that the division of labor arises out of people's innate propensity to exchange. And as from that desire to exchange, the sort of spontaneous division of tasks among people emerges. Now, I emphasize the aspect of spontaneous. Ferguson, for example, talks about the fact that nations stumble upon establishments such as the division of labor, that they are the result of human action, but not of human design. 
So the emphasis here in the classical economics is something that arises spontaneously and unplanned. On the other hand, the French liberal school, particularly uh, the Stude de Tracy, I have a paper on this. <clears throat> um, he talks about division of labor as being a more purposeful action where individuals understand the benefits of division of labor. They understand the benefits of specializing and exchanging the goods that they have produced and that they engage in this process of specialization in a purposeful way. The reason I make this distinction is because the classical sort of more Ricardian Smithian approach of the more unplanned, spontaneous ver explanation of division of labor is the one that eventually made it to neoclassical economics, where it became easier to treat it in mathematical models, where you eliminate the acting individual out of it. And suddenly you can start talking about nations specializing, when in fact nations cannot specialize because nations cannot act. On the other hand, the Austrian approach to the question of division of labor is much more akin to the treatments that it had received during the um, 19th century in the French liberal school. And it's much more related to the idea of purposefulness. So when we talk about the about Mises and Rothbard and the Austrian economic approach to what division of labor is, we're really looking at it as an intellectual phenomenon. So it's not something that belongs in international trade textbooks. It's an, it's an intellectual phenomenon. It's not an instinctual phenomenon. It, it is a purposeful utilization of the laws of economics in order to improve our welfare. So that's a bit of a whirlwind uh, discussion of um, what, the, um, what the history of the concept has been. So what is division of labor? That's a very poor definition there that you would find in a standard dictionary, simply defined as the division of a process of employment into parts, each of which is carried out by a separate person. That I think is the general definition that you would find uh, even in an economics textbook what an Austrian would call division of labor would be purposeful specialization in production according to efficiency. Now, this applies to individuals. Individuals specialize. This applies to factors of production as well. Factors of production can be specialized into particular areas of production. So it applies to land, it applies to capital goods, and it applies to labor. And if you think about the division of employment among persons, you can think of it as division of labor at a horizontal level. So we divide the tasks among people in society. If you think of specialization of the factors of production, you can think of how we divide labor vertically across the process of production. You'll start to piece this, these elements together as you go through this um, week in more detail and you learn more about the structure of production and so on. But I just wanted to highlight to you that when we talk about division of labor, it is not simply about division of labor among persons, but it's also the specialization, um, the sort of the vertical aspect of specialization as well. At the same time, we talk about, oh yeah. <laughs> um, so we talk about purposefulness as well, yeah? So, um, we talk about individuals, not this particular individual, but we talk about individuals understanding the benefits of um, specialization and doing it purposefully to improve their own um, welfare. So as I was saying before, we don't want to say the U.S. specializes in car production. We don't want to say Spain specializes in wine, pr wine production. It is only individuals that uh, act. So where do the benefits of division of labor come from? It's not from cutting down our lawns and growing different crops. <laughs> the benefits of the division of labor stem from the fact that human beings are um, diverse. They are unequal in um, the things that they have been endowed with and the talents that they have been endowed with. 
and it stems from the geographical differences um, across areas of the world um, in how they have been endowed in terms of natural resources and in time and how these endowments have um, been different through the creation of capital goods. And the idea is that as we specialize and we produce um, different things, human effort under the division of labor becomes more productive than human effort in isolation. And this is what I'm going to try to show you in a minute through the example. But the key point that I will make in the hope that you will remember after the lecture today is that individuals are able to grasp this fact and they are able to purposefully use it to improve their welfare. I want to make a little nuance here. So division of labor is not simply teamwork. So it doesn't simply mean just pooling resources and doing the same task together. It really means specializing, doing different tasks according to our relative efficiency. This is an insight I try to get across to my husband all the time and he does not get it. So he just follows me around doing the same chores that I do, which doesn't really work and it does not improve our welfare or our marriage for that matter. Um, <clears throat> so again, division of labor, it's about specializing in different tasks. And the question becomes, of course, how do we know what those tasks are? Keep that in mind. Specialization, however, isn't simply enough. So, okay, we specialize and I decide to produce one thing and you produce another thing. There are two conditions that are absolutely necessary there in order for that to really improve welfare. The first thing is that it must be complemented by exchange. Yeah. If we specialize, but we cannot exchange the fruits of our production, emphasis on free. So if we cannot freely trade with each other, then we cannot really reap the benefits of that specialization. And our specialization must be done according to market signals. So how do we know what tasks we need to specialize in? According to classical economists, you would look at the cost in terms of labor hours, and you would specialize in the goods that you were best at producing, which would cost you least in terms of labor hours. And of course, the, 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 the doctrine of comparative advantage and the whole idea of division of labor has come into a lot of attack because it has been seen as intrinsically connected to the labor theory of value. But that's not really true. We do know what to, we need to specialize it because we have market prices. So in a modern monetary economy, we'd look at money prices. Those are the market signals that individuals and entrepreneurs, and capitalists, those are the market signals that we can interpret to understand what we need to specialize. Where are our natural aptitudes, our endowments, our property? What are they best, most efficiently used um, for the improvement of our welfare and the welfare of society? We can do that by looking at money prices. <clears throat> and I will emphasize again, as we go through, that this idea is intrinsic to understanding why we need unhampered division of labor, why we need free trade. Because those unhampered money prices, if they are the signal which tells us how we need to specialize, the moment any interference is made with those money prices, then those signals no longer reflect the most efficient areas of specialization. Yeah, I made the mistake of looking that way. Um, <laughs> So just a couple more definitions before we wrap up this um, part of the lecture. Money, the generally accepted, commonly used medium of exchange. Dr. Sandy Klein will, will talk to you right after this lecture about this, um, just so that we are on the same page um, as we talk. So money prices, simply quantity of money given in exchange for a particular good or service. Again, I will emphasize that if money prices tell us how we need to specialize, how the division of labor needs to take place. If you want division of labor, it's the flip side of the structure of money prices in society. Then government intervention, everything that restricts the use 
of our body, our property, that restricts, forbids a relationship between two economic actors, automatically affects the fabric of the division of labor. And we'll talk, when we talk about implications, what far-reaching effects that has. Right. So we said, I said I was going to give you an example. Um, and in this particular example, I tried to steer away from the classical cloth, wine, grains, wine example and tried to bring it a bit more up to date. So I've chosen two people. Their names are Tom and Stephen. I used to have Dr. Salerno as an example in previous years when I was braver. Um, particularly, they have last names, by the way. So that's Stephen Fry. Do you know Stephen Fry? The actor, comedian, yeah, also writes a lot on Greek mythology and so on, which is why he's here. Does anybody know Tom Holland? Yes. I thought I was going to get a much stronger reaction at Stephen Fry, but I'm really delighted that I don't have to tell you just how brilliant Tom Holland is. If you haven't listened to his Rest is History podcast, please do. So if you imagine we have Tom and Stephen, and they both write history, and they both are good at doing podcasts or narrating and so on. You can see at how productive they are, yeah? So if we would look at how many goods per hour they could produce, Tom could write 40 pages in an hour and Stephen could write only 10 pages. I adjusted for their ages. Um, and Tom could narrate or you know, do two chapters, the equivalent of it in podcasts, and Stephen could do one chapter. If you look simply at the absolute quantities that they are able to produce, in an hour, it is obvious that Tom has an absolute advantage at both writing history and narrating history, let's say, and Stephen doesn't have an absolute advantage at either. So if you were to just look at that, you would simply say, well, obviously Tom doesn't need Stephen for any of his writing or narrating needs. He can just go do both and then Stephen is completely eliminated out of the division of labor nobody requires him. However, if you look at their relative efficiency, if you look at their opportunity cost, you can see that it is a lot more expensive for Tom to give up writing for an hour than it is for Stephen. And you could see that it is a lot more expensive for Stephen to give up narrating for an hour than it is for Tom. So if we are looking at comparative advantage, in fact, Tom has a comparative advantage at higher relative efficiency in writing history, and Stephen has a higher relative efficiency at nar narrating. So now we know where how they need to specialize. So if this is before specialization, where they each work 10 hours a day, and let's say they split their time equally, yeah? Um, Tom can work five hours on writing, 40 pages per hour, and then he can work five hours on narrating, two chapters per hour, same thing for Stephen. At the end of the day together, they can write 250 pages in 15 chapters. Now, you may note that this is a completely made up example because I wish this was the level of productivity, not of just Tom Holland and Stephen Fry, but myself as well, um, if only. Although I will say, and you may ask for stories that maybe Murray Rothbard might have come close to this. <laughs> After specialization, let's assume Stephen spends his entire day narrating, and which allows now Tom to spend seven hours writing and three hours on his podcast. So at the end of the day, after specialization, they produce more goods, which is an improvement in their welfare. They have 280 uh, pages and 16 chapters. Now, I have chosen this example to be a little drier in terms of you being able to understand, okay, so what is the benefit that they get? Have they written so many pages and chapters? Because in a modern monetary economy, we no longer barter with each other. This is the kind of thing that we produce. So obviously, in order for us to be able to fully judge the benefits or the increase in welfare, we need to think of it in monetary terms. And I have a quote here from Mises, who includes this in his discussion 
uh, of the division of labor and society in the chapter of human society uh, in human action. And he includes this before he even actually talks in human action about monetary calculation. But he wants to make a specific point where he says, we must not fall prey to the illusion that, a, that the way to judge the profitability of a production process or the rentability of a certain type of employment can be achieved without the aid of monetary calculation. So yes, it's nice to have these worked examples to understand efficiency, but these are just examples that we use to teach really in the monetary economy. I'm getting there, there you go. We need to think in money terms. So if you look at their monetary income per day, you can see before specialization at those prices, they would have made $12,000 again, completely made up example. I was just being really, really hopeful that day. And after specialization, they would be making, let's say $14,000. Now, why is specialization more productive than human effort in isolation? As we mentioned before, because we have different natural aptitudes. So we, if we dedicate ourselves to where we have natural aptitudes, we are naturally more productive. We also have acquired aptitudes. Um, believe it or not, I was way worse at giving lectures six, 10 years ago. But as you specialize, you become a lot better at what you're doing. So you acquire the aptitude in the increase in productivity. You spend less time switching between tasks. Again, I try to convey this to my husband all the time. He doesn't get it. Um, but those things are good, but their impact isn't tremendous. The reason that division of labor has been instrumental to the development of the market economy to the levels that we know today is because it has allowed us to split a production process into stages and into different employments and to use capital goods to automate those stages. It is because we no longer produce everything ourselves, but we have capital goods and different stages of production, which have been brought about by the fact that we do have division of labor. It is that process of using capital goods and automation that brings about the greatest benefits through the division of labor. So again, I gave the example of an AI assistant because this is the only thing that we talk about in higher education these days. What is AI going to do? Is it going to happen? Is it going to take over? If you imagine if you're Tom Holland and Stephen Fry and you can automate certain parts of the writing process, maybe the proof editing, if you can automate certain parts of the, you know, the audio production of the podcasts and so on, you can become a lot more productive. Again, a lot more productive. But I was trying to convey to you that the greatest benefits come from using capital goods and automation. So just to sum up this part where we talk about the comparative advantage, um, you can define it as the relative superiority in a particular task when taking all of the tasks into account. And if you put this together with the definition of division of labor, so division of labor is purposeful specialization in, productive, in production according to efficiency, specifically according to this relative efficiency um, that is shown by comparative advantage. This is my favorite quote from Paul Samuelson, not that I have a lot of favorite codes from Paul Samuelson. Um, but on this particular topic, he's actually not bad at all. Um, he does have a, a great essay where he talks about how this concept of comparative advantage seems so trivial, seems so simple. And yet the fact that it is not trivial is attested by the thousands of important and intelligent men who have never been able to grasp the doctrine for themselves or believe it after it was explained to them. And I will re-emphasize again that it's the money, it's money prices uh, as we go into the next part of the lecture, that it's money prices that provide the signals and the incentives for the individuals to choose their most efficient or productive specialization available, available, and also for the entrepreneurs through the process of profit and loss to choose the most efficient processes of production. Now, let me just say a few words about Mises' law of association, because I started by saying that the Misesian law of association is a lot broader, is a lot richer than the um, Ricardian comparative advantage. 
if you've read human action, you will see that in human action, Mises actually calls it the Ricardian law of association. So I, I have reread the chapter. I haven't forgotten that that's what he calls it, but that's one example of Mises's um, modesty and deference to the economists that have come before him. But it is actually Murray Rothbard, he has an essay on freedom, inequality, primitivism, and the division of labor, where he himself admits that he, for the longest time, he had uh, he had uh, overestimated the contributions of the classical economists on this particular topic and underestimated the contributions made by Mises. So Mises takes this simple um, aspect of um, the Ricardian comparative advantage and turns it into an explanation of how the market economy and how society develops. So for Mises, the fact that individuals are able to purposefully understand, are able to understand rationally the benefits of specialization and to purposefully specialize and exchange in order to improve their welfare, doesn't simply explain why nations trade with each other, why France and Spain trade with each other. But what it does explain is why social cooperation is a universal phenomenon and why that social cooperation persists. So it's not our culture that binds us together. It is not our faith that binds us together. I mean, of course, it's that too, but it is not primarily that. According to Mises, it is the economic bonds that we forge through the process of division of labor that bring us together as a society. So the market economy, uses these prices and incentives to guide entrepreneurs and individuals to integrate themselves into the division of labor. And they do that to their advantage and to the advantage of, the, uh, of their fellow men. And that is the fundamental foundation of society. Now, division of labor can grow, and Mises makes these fantastic points um, in that little chapter. Again, it's in the section on human society, not accidentally in the section of human society. He talks about how div division of labor can grow. And when he says division of labor can grow extensively, um, he means it can grow to encompass the whole world. It can grow in the number of people that are involved in the division of labor. When he says division of labor can grow intensively, he means uh, it can grow in terms of the vertical aspects of it in how our processes of production uh, can specialize. And that, again, can happen in a monetary uh, market economy. We're doing rather well, I have to say. We might even have uh, time for questions. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, some of the first implications um, of the law uh, of the Misesian law of association, or if you want to simply call it a Ricardian comparative advantage, that's fine. Um, I don't want to be too harsh to Ricardo. Um, but the first implication here is that comparative advantage is something that is dynamic. So comparative advantage is not a static aspect of the market economy. The fact that U.S. specializes in car production isn't something that is necessarily true next year, isn't something that is intrinsically given to the United States and so on. And it works obviously for the individual level. The fact that um, you know, we teach today here, the fact that Tom Holland has a podcast, that is not something that is supposed to last forever. Comparative advantage changes as monetary prices change. And they change with consumer preferences. If in a few years, podcasts fall out of fashion, then Tom Holland's particular comparative advantage in um, giving podcasts will just fall by the wayside. He might have to become an influencer or a personal trainer or who knows, something completely. He is an influencer deep down. We all know that. Yeah. But what does that mean? Well, if comparative advantage is indeed dynamic, what that means is that governments cannot really know what it should be. So if comparative advantage really changes and it changes with market preferences, then governments and governmental bureaucrats cannot sit in an office and say, this is what you should specialize in. This is what you should trade. So automatically it becomes impossible for them to plan. Yeah. 
and obviously to do um, trade policy. We'll get to that in a minute. So I asked um, Microsoft's Bing Copilot to give me an image of um, people using typewriters, and uh, it came up with this. Um, so it is dynamic. So jobs have changed. Yeah, we used to use typewriters. Um, and obviously now we use complicated computers. And then eventually we may use generative AI for a lot of things. During that process, a lot of jobs will disappear. And during that process, a lot of jobs will appear again. So again, I may have had a comparative advantage in being a typist. That is no longer true a couple of decades later. And to be honest, I have no idea if in 15 years from now, the job that I do on a regular basis at a university in England will bring me any kind of monetary income in the format that it is today. Yeah. So I really want to underscore the fact that division of labor and that the pattern of division of labor and where comparative advantage is for each individual and entrepreneur and firm is really a very dynamic process, as dynamic as the market. Oh, okay, I had the AI overlords. I had a picture of them as well. Comparative advantages will also be located at what we call the market level of detail. If you've ever had the morbid curiosity at looking at how um, a, the United States government, for example, defines uh, goods when they cross international borders. So if they look at the international um, trade classifications, you will see that there are some very broad categories there. So they'll say, oh, they specialize in appliances. And that includes washing machines and refrigerators and so on. Or specializes in um, mass produced food. Yeah, and that include everything from TV dinners to burgers and so on. But that's not really what it is. In the market, you could have a comparative advantage in producing milkshakes really fancy milkshakes, you know, the ones with the Oreos and the everything. I dream of those every single day. That could be your comparative advantage. So again, exactly what you specialize in will not be these sort of broad categories. It'll be the market and the market signals that uh, tell you that. So again, if a trade policy is somehow trying to target, to develop uh, a particular line of specialization in a particular economy. It can be very difficult, it can be impossible um, to do that effectively outside of the market. And it can also be unexpected. Again, it can be that we have jobs that we haven't thought about um, that could exist in 20 years, or it could simply be that it looks like you're not really contributing much to society. Now, I could have brought the example of influencers for that example and say, really, how do they contribute to the division of labor? But they do, and we have the signals that tell us because they can have a monetary income out of that. Sometimes those signals are a bit more subtle. It could simply be that people care for whatever that particular person can produce and they care for and maybe they include them um, charitably in the division of labor. I have a very specific example in mind. So this is Saint Paisios of Mount Athos. If you know a little bit about Greece, know a little bit about Mount Athos, there's a lot of monks and monasteries and ascetics that live there. According to Mises, if you read Human Action, ascetics are not part of the division of labor. And I'm not here to criticize Mises, but he's wrong on this. Um, <laughs> ascetics are part of the division of labor. They produce a good that's not palpable. They produce a good that it's not necessarily exchanged or traded in the market and so on. But it is a good that is valuable. I would call it, it is a capital good. It's a good about how we understand life or death and so on. But they are part of the division of labor because they are integrated by people around them in this division of labor and they do exchange. People bring them food and they care for them and so on in exchange for their advice. Yeah. So I do think they, Mises was a little rushed here in saying that they don't necessarily belong to um, the division of labor. My point here simply being is that we do not really know. Yeah. We cannot really say from a bird's eye view, that is not a productive line of specialization, that is not part of the division of labor and so on. So we talked about the fact that division of labor can grow extensively in terms of encompassing um, everybody in the world, ideally. And obviously that is 
the utmost limit that it can grow to, yeah, of the discovered world that we know. Um, but that's a, obviously a sort of a natural um, limitation. The other limitation to the division of labor is the extent of our savings and investments, so the extent of our capital accumulation. Anything that destroys the accumulation of capital in society inevitably impacts division of labor because it prevents us from further um, specializing across the factors of production or it distorts the signals that we get. So I won't emphasize, I won't um, tell you more about this because you do have lectures coming up about business cycle theory, about banking, about money and so on. But I just wanted to say that the limit, that the, the extent of the savings and investment in society, the extent of capital accumulation is a significant limit to the division of labor or alternatively not to limit. So the more the savings grow, the more invested investment grows, the more division of labor grows. I did mention that there are natural um, barriers to the division of labor. So again, um, could be culture or preferences. Again, to use the famous example, my husband doesn't want to specialize or trade the chores with me, and that's fine. That's a natural barrier. Um, and there are also artificial barriers. And they all come from government intervention. So all the artificial barriers in the way of the development of the division of labor come through um, government intervention. Government saying you're not allowed to trade this, or if you trade this, this should be the price, or this should be the tariff, and so on. I will have a talk on Wednesday morning on free trade and protectionism where we will talk, we'll expand on these aspects as well. Now I will wrap up. Um, by um, dwelling a little bit on the implications of the division of labor on society and what we call sort of social order. So again, I'll come back to the analytical coup, if you want to call it, of Mises's law of association. If, well, not if, when you read human action, um, three, four, five times, I would say, um, before you can fully, truly understand what a tremendous book it is. Um, the key insight that comes of Mises's work on this is that the structure of money prices, the division of labor, and the social connections among um, individuals, they are accomplished as one process in the market economy. This is why you don't see in Austrian economics a separate theory of international trade like you do in Main Street economics. And when I started as a student, I found that rather baffling um, because I had come from studying trade. This was one of my sort of minor specializations as part of my economics degree. I had done both of my thesis on international trade. And I thought, where are the treatises on international trade from the Austrian economics point of view? And the reason there aren't any is because there is no fundamental difference between domestic trade and international trade. Division of labor, society, trade, they're part of the, fund as the same fundamental process of the market economy. Yeah, they're sides of the same coin. That's why they're my Roman Empire. So division of labor and society are equivalent. That's why Mises calls division of labor the essence of society the fundamental social phenomenon. It is through the fact that we have this, these economic bonds that we have managed to develop as a society. Now, I will not say that our friendships and social connections and social bonds and religious bonds and so on are not important, but I will say that they are a lot weaker and a lot more likely to break down if the economic bonds are lacking, which is why the best way to offset any kind of anti-social initiatives, if you want to think of wars or conflicts or things like that, is to strengthen these economic bonds. Strengthening the economic bonds between individuals, between nations, if you want, at this particular point, will strengthen society. So 
you can define society as a result of that, as the complex network of interhuman relationships, which result from what we started with, the purposeful recognition of the mutual benefits of economic cooperation. But if the governments are in the way all the time, then it becomes a lot harder to understand those benefits. Again, I'll talk about this bit more on Wednesday. But every single time governments interfere with the division of labor and either they and, and they, they decrease um, the effectiveness of those market signals, then we as individuals do not reap those full benefits. And as a result, it becomes a lot harder to even understand how those benefits should work. So it is extremely important that we understand that the survival of society, gosh, I sound very doomsday-like, but <laughs> the, society, the survival of human society depends on understanding these benefits of, um, of the, these mutual benefits of economic cooperation. So the more we intensify division of labor, the more we develop cooperation domestically and internationally is the surest way in which we can offset um, anti-social initiatives. And I say truly domestically is where we start. The problem that we have right now, if you look at international trade, is that we do not have enough domestic freedom in order to be able to reap those benefits. So whenever we say, oh, we've liberalized trade, and then people look for the effects of that liberalization, say, well, where are they? The reason they're not there is because we do not have domestic freedom. They are one and the same thing. Yeah. So the greatest and most immediate peril remains either the partial or the total state control um, over market prices. Um, and this is the, um, again, this is the sort of the fundamental insight that I want you to take away today, is that any kind of intervention with market prices really saps the fabric of society. It is really that um, important, and it does this through affected the processes through which division of labor uh, produces um, benefits for society. There are two minutes for questions. Isn't that fantastic? There we go. I'll leave the future, re the further reading on. My timings are impeccable. Just a question. You mentioned that the division of labor is a core part of society. Um, in the family, that's non-monetary, but obviously on a large scale it is. Where is the dividing line between when the division of labor becomes non-monetary and monetary? Right. So, um, well, that's an interesting question. I can pass it to Sandy about the development of uh, money and the later question. Um, really, I would, as far as the explanation is concerned, I would want you to fully understand division of labor in purely in monetary terms. That's really how it works. So again, Ricardo's example came at a time when this wasn't fully understood. There is no definition. We no longer have a barter economy. Now, once money comes onto the scene, the barter economy sort of disappears. There's no such thing as real prices hiding under the monetary prices and so on. Yeah, we have a monetary economy. And if I understood your question correctly, yeah, um, division of labor is the flip side of the structure of monetary prices. So the structure of monetary prices tells you where those um, areas of employment, of most efficient employment exist. Uh, so how can we be sure that people will specialize according to their comparative advantage? And does that depend on if they have like perfect information about their abilities? No, it does not depend on whether they have perfect information or not. It's obviously trial and error. There's profit and loss and so on. The only way in which you can ensure that they do specialize in the most efficient way is by not interfering with the money prices. So just sort of stepping aside and letting the market sort of arrange this pattern. Obviously, people are not perfectly rational. People do make mistakes and that's absolutely fine, but that's all part of the corrective process of the market. I think there's stuff. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you.